Hello, my name is Michael Jones, and in this presentation, we're going to talk about the topic of counseling and technology. Because of COVID-19, we've seen a big push for, uh, for therapists to get out there and to provide services through video-based services, through text-based services, and also through email. And so because of this, it's important for us to understand what does counseling and technology look like and where are we headed with this in the future. So I want to spend some time talking to you about that. Uh, this is an area that I've been working in for the past 12 years, uh, doing online therapy. And so I hope that the things I have to bring forward to you today will be something be beneficial to you. Some of the current conflicts we're seeing with telemental health counseling is what and that's the official term we'll use during this video, is that we have a conflict that's going on. That when we talk about delivery of counseling and services, specifically when we're talking about looking at online counseling, the, the, the conflict we're seeing, it comes between state law, between ethics, federal law, and also liability insurance. And so we want to talk about these four main ideas. So when it comes to state law, many states are now encouraging telemental health practice, and some are just are actually requiring it for individuals to get out there and start working with clients through the use of video. An important reason why they're doing this is because they don't want more people to get sick, and this is something. Uh, and telemental health counseling is something that's been 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 practiced for multiple years now. But we've seen over the past few years it's, it's gained a lot more popularity. But because of different uh, the, the pandemic that is going on, we are noticing that more people are starting to practice online. And so the question then becomes, what does my state have to say about it? And so it's important for us to know what our state laws uh, and how they support us, or whether that uh, they support us doing telemental health counseling and also the rules they have for that. And so we want to look at that and be able to kind of be keeping that in the back of our minds as we go through this presentation of what does our state law have to say about it. Also looking at the ethical piece of it is that whenever we do any type of counseling, we be able, must be able to show competence and remain in our scope of practice. And what this basically means is, is that I'm not just doing something just because it sounds cool or sounds fun. I'm doing it because I've, I've had training in this area. I'm competent in being able to do telemental health counseling. And I'm also doing something that's within my scope of practice. And, that, and basically our scope of practice is the things that we've been trained for. And so it's important for us to make sure that we know how to go about and practice telemental health counseling and training comes into play when we look at, look at that. So it's important for us to look at that piece uh, today and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about ethics as we go through this presentation. Another thing is looking at federal law. And the federal law, when it, when it begins to take place, it looks at the, us using HIPAA secure software used in a compliant manner. And basically what HIPAA's main concern is, is making sure that we don't break the confidentiality of our client's information when we're sending it through electronic means. And so we want to make sure that we are covering them and we want to make sure that as we do that, that we do it in a compliant manner. So that regardless of what software we are using, we, we want to be HIPAA uh, secure software, but not only does it need to be HIPAA secure software, we need to use it in a compliant manner. That means we, we go through some uh, certain steps to make sure that our software is used in the right way. And then we want to need to look at our liability insurance. Uh, even as a student, you must have some type of liability insurance in order to practice as a counselor. And so the one question we have to ask ourselves is, does, will my, tell, will my uh, liability insurance company cover me for telemental health counseling? And one of the things we're finding is that if you don't have any training in this area, then you can't get covered to do telemental health counseling unless you can show that you've been trained and done some training in the field of telemental health counseling. And so the problem is that some, sometimes these four things do come in conflict with each other. That sometimes when it comes to federal law, federal law may say, hey, we want you to use HIPAA compliant ma manners, but because of, because of COVID-19, your state may say, we don't care what software you use. And then once again, you may uh, not have the training that you're told supposed to do according to the uh, ethical code, but then your state is still asking you to practice. And so you might see that the, so the problem ends up becoming these four areas of concerns begin to have a conflict with each other because the state may say one thing, or federal law may say something different, the ethical uh, 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 guidelines we have may say something different, and then we have a liability insurance coverage is saying something different. And so we have to be able to maneuver through these four different pieces to make sure we're delivering counseling services in the right manner. So what we want to do in this presentation is talk a little bit about counseling technology and what counts as technology. Uh, when we talk about the topic of technology just in general, many people have a different understanding of what technology is actually covered when it comes to, to telemental, telemental health counseling. And so we want to cover those and figure out what counts as technology. 
Another thing we want to look at is what are ways that technology encounters counselors interface. And it's more than just in a counseling session. We end up interfacing other ways as well. So we want to talk about that in this presentation. And also some benefit and danger zones of using technology in counseling. So there could be some positive things we use in technology, but there's also some danger zones we want to stay away from as well as we try to make sure we do the best we possibly can for the clients um, that we're working with. And so one way that we end up coming in contact with technology is through an EHR or, or we call it an electronic health record. And basically what an electronic health record does, it allows you to be able to collect all of your client's information in one electronic record versus having a paper file. Uh, I can remember working for a counseling agency many years ago, and the room was probably 15 by 20 feet, and inside that room was nothing but cabinets. And in those cabinets were all the client files that, that, they, uh, that they had had for the past 15 years or so. And so the problem with it was basically anybody with a key could get into that office and, and, and see the records, and so there really wasn't any security there for client records. And so for multiple years now, we've had this thing called electronic health records, where you're able to digitize people's records to make a lot more secure and make it a lot more difficult for people to be able to get into a good client's records. And so back in 2009, there became a, another uh, uh, another. Uh, federal law came out called High Tech. And the High Tech Act, but basically cover it was, it looks at how do we go about transferring our client's information when it's in a digital format. And so we, so when we think about HIPAA, HIPAA mainly is, mainly is concerned with looking at uh, the, um, make, HIPAA's mainly concerned in looking at uh, you making sure you're not breaking confidentiality of client's information. High Tech looks at how do you go about transferring information back and forth with, between two parties. And so if you want to go to that uh, link there at the bottom of the screen there, it gives you a lot more information about some different electronic health records that you may be coming in contact with as you progress through the counseling field. So as we define telehealth, uh, this is the definition we want to use. That telehealth assumes that we're transmitting images, voice, or data between two or more health units. And so that's the main way people are, been, are getting to get the information going back and forth. So it may be a video session, I'm able to transfer back and forth my voice and picture during that, or it may be a phone session, even though we've been doing phone counseling forever, that falls under the, 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 the uh, auspice of being considered telemental health counseling. It could be through a text message or even through a chat message as well. But these are all different ways in which telehealth is defined. And so basically telehealth is just an umbrella term for any time we're providing counseling services through telephone, email, chat, or video. And it's important that as we go through and we look at this, we think about this presentation, to remember that whenever you are, are getting trained or whenever you are learning more about telemental health, that you learn how to do it in all these different formats. Because there may be some populations where they're not able to have a good, strong video connection. And so if you're only trained to, do, trained to do it during video and they need a telephone session, you still want to know how to be able to provide services for them. And so it's important to know how to do therapy services through these four different mediums. So the next question then becomes up is why telehealth? Why in the world do we want to end up dealing with telehealth in the first place? And the reason why I think telehealth becomes uh, really important is because there are several different populations that we have out there who don't have any, any sort of way of being able to connect if it wasn't for telehealth. And the first one is what we call the rural population. Um, I grew up in a very, very rural state. I currently live in the rural state of Arkansas. And one thing we're noticing that is there are a lot of people in the state of Arkansas where there, we do have a lot of therapists, but we do have a lot of areas where we don't have therapists to provide services for clients. Another issue with that is that being in a rural area, not everyone has high-speed internet. That even in the year 2020, some people still have dial-up internet. And so because of that, they don't have the ability to be able to connect through a video service to be able to um, to work with their clients. And so being able to have telemental health, it helps people to be able to connect with those populations who live in rural areas so they can get the kind of help they need in general. Another place we see where this is important is, is in a prison system. 
Uh, I have had the, the, the fortunate ability to be able to go out and work in prisons before doing like case management and also crisis interventions. Uh, but one of, one of the problems we were seeing with that was sometimes these uh, the, the prisoners were having problems in the middle of the night. So it's two or three o'clock in the morning, they're feel, feeling suicidal, and here I am trying to drive an hour and a half to a prison in the middle of the night to provide services for a client. Well, it, it, that that only lasted for such a long for an, for enough time that we we decided there was a better way to be able to do that. So we started seeing that prisons are now beginning to use telemental health where they're being able to put a video uh, conferencing system in a prison system in a special room, and maybe at your clinic, at your community agency you work for, they have a, a video system set up there, and then where the prisoners are able to get the counseling uh, that they need and are able to get that through video-based services, and so it makes it a lot better for them that way. And it also provides a safety net for the therapists as well. So if they're having any type of nervousness or whatever the case may be when dealing with prisons or dealing with prisoners, this gives them a safety net to be able to uh, still see the clients, provide them the services that they need, but also do it from the safety of a, a, a closed environment. And so uh, prisons is another place we see this as being very important. Another place is just with our military. Uh, the VA or the Veterans Administration has been using telemental health for years. And one of the main reasons why they want to do that is because our military are spread throughout the United States, are spread throughout the United, the whole world, for a matter, that matter of fact. And because of this, many of them are in remote locations. And for many of them, they may be, they may see or hear things that may cause them some, uh, some mental health issues. And so they need to be able to be in touch with someone and have some counseling and be able to, uh, to be able to talk about the things that's going on with them. And so when the military is using telehealth quite a bit more because they're seeing it's, it's helping people who are out in the field who are fighting to be able to get some of the, the needs they need, some of the needs they have met as well. Another population we see is those with depression. And you may be wondering why I specifically talk about depression. When, we, when you think about depression in general, a lot of times when people are depressed, for lack of a better term, they act depressed. And so in these, these modes of depression, they're doing things about like not getting out of bed or not taking a shower. Not, there are many things they're not doing, uh, tour, working towards good health. And so when I find a client who may be depressed, who may not want to come into to a counseling session in an office setting, it's easy for me to offer them a video-based service because now they can still get the counseling they need, even though they may still be at their home. They may not really be ready to get out yet, but enough sessions in their home setting through use of video specifically or through any other means as well, it may be a way for them to get to let their depression come back to a certain point where they're able to get out and start working with people as well. And so that becomes a good way to work with this population is through telehealth services. Another group is with those with social phobias. Um, I can remember a time having a client who had a really big issue with uh, being around big crowds. And so I worked at a community mental health agency. And during that time period, we had a very small lobby that held like 20 something people, uh, about, about maybe 20, 25 people in the lobby. This person would come to the counseling sessions. Most of the uh, lobby would be full of people and babies and different things like that. And this would ra actually raise anxiety level and the social phobia of the client that I was seeing. And so they would go basically hide in the back of the, uh, the agency in a, in a separate room or wherever the case may be until I was ready to see them. And the problem would be is that by the time I would get them into like, the counseling session, we would spend the first 10 or 15 minutes trying to de-escalate them before I could actually talk to them about their social phobia. So coming into that actual counseling agency caused more problems for them than helped them in, in the long run. And so sometimes those with social phobias, this could be a good way to work with them to get through some of that, that phobia that they're dealing with at the beginning until they are able to come into an actual counseling setting. And so we see telehealth being important there. Another thing we're, well, population we're seeing that this is, could be great for is those in a lower socioeconomic status. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, especially when I work with community mental health, is that transportation becomes a big issue for those uh, in, the, in that low SES uh, group. And that is not a judgment towards them or anything at all, but that, that ends up being a problem, especially when you live in an area like mine where there's not any public transportation or Ubers or anything like that. And so they end up uh, find themselves uh, depending quite a bit on other people for rides uh, to, to sessions and things like that. 
Well, if they're not able to get a ride to a session, what ends up happening is they end up canceling the sessions and not able to come in because of transportation. And so once again, telehealth becomes this thing that helps them out quite a bit so they're able to get in and be able to, to work and, and get the counseling and stuff they need without being concerned about the uh, uh, having transportation to get in and so when you have, have maybe have a lot of lower uh, SES people uh, or population as a part of your caseload this could be a good way for you to work with them as well and also children and adolescents there may be times where uh, the children may not be once uh, be comfortable coming in to a counseling room uh, because it's the first time that they're, they're doing it and so maybe their parent can meet with them online with you first to be able to do a few sessions that way to help them get comfortable around you but I've seen with children and adolescents, this could be a good way to break the ice with them and build rapport. So these are just a few different populations that we see are very, uh, who, who could really, really much, could pretty much use a lot of help but with, through the use of telemental health counseling. And so these would be some population I would definitely think about using it with. Obviously, there are multiple populations that can be used, but, but specifically, these are ones I want to bring out uh, in this video. So as you begin to consider telemental health, there's several different considerations you need to look at. First of all, we gotta look, check and see, is it legal? And the reason why we, we wanna check to see if it's legal because we need to make sure we check the state license laws that we have. One thing people ask all the time is when it comes to uh, when thinking about telemental health counseling, they think, well, if I am trained in this, this means I can see anybody in the world I want to see. And it's actually, that's not true. Uh, what we're seeing with most uh, codes of ethics, specifically the ACA code of ethics and NBCC code of ethics as well, uh, what we're seeing overall, they're saying is that you need to be licensed in the state where your client is physically at the time of the appointment and where you are at the time of the appointment. So for example, I am a practitioner in Arkansas. And so I will have, so we will say I have Arkansas clients. If I end up going to a, on vacation, for example, and, uh, and I'm in Alabama during that time period, then while I'm in Alabama, I'm not able to see my clients in Arkansas unless I have the permission of the, uh, the permission of Alabama, and it goes other way as well. I could be here at home and then here in Arkansas, and then my client goes on out of town for a month or whatever, and they are in the state of Wisconsin, and just because they. Uh, their residence is in Arkansas, that really doesn't make a difference. At the time of the counseling service, if they're in Wisconsin and I'm in Arkansas, then I can only see that client if I'm both uh, licensed in the state of Arkansas and also in the state of Wisconsin. So there are a few states that, that will, very few states that do that will waive some things for you, but in general, that's the rule of thumb. So it's important for you to make sure you check the state license laws uh, for both the state that you're in and where your client is at the time of the import of the of the uh, session, it, and I just think this is something very important to do to make sure that you're practicing legally and ethically. Also, the next question we want to look at is: Is it confidential and HIPAA secure? Uh, there are so many different uh, types of technology out there that you can use to be able to connect with people for services. Uh, the biggest thing you want to make sure to do is that when you look at these, uh, the, the, the software you're looking at, is that the software is HIPAA secure. Now, there's two different terms I want to use here: is HIPAA secure and HIPAA compliant. Now, you will see a lot of times where people will advertise a software as being HIPAA compliant, but the reality of it is, there's no such thing as HIPAA compliant software. Software can't be compliant. Software can only be secure. The compliance part comes with you as a practitioner, that you use the software in the right way in order for that to happen. So part of that process is we wanna make sure, once again, that we, we check on the software to make sure it's HIPAA secure. Another thing we wanna look at is making sure we get is what is called a BAA, or a Business Associate Agreement. And all a Business Associate Agreement is, this basically means that the, uh, the software you're using, they, they'll have access to your client's records, and they're basically signing off to say that, they're, that, they're, they're, that they won't break any confidentiality with you or with your client because they do have access to that. And so these business associate agreements are important throughout the counseling world in general. Let's say, for instance, for existence, I have a, a cough, I have a, a Coke machine in my counseling office, and someone who works for Coke comes in uh, each week to fill the machine up. 
Well, they're going to see clients there. And so I can't just say, well, don't say anything. I want to make sure that I have a business associate agreement with them that says, once again, that they're not going to talk about anything they see inside the session. And so whenever we look at we look at software, we're looking for software that is HIPAA secure, uh, and that's going to help you to know how to go about working with your clients and, and, and in a manner that, protect, that protects them. Also, another thing we need to consider is are you and the client have technology, are you competent when it comes to technology? Now, uh, for me, I think it's important that uh, I, I kind of laugh a little bit because when I think about this, sometimes we think that we, uh, we have competent, competence in technology just because we know how to use a phone and things like that. The reality of it is that sometimes we don't have the right amount of, of competence when it comes to technology. Uh, one thing, uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, training in this area. I've, I've, trained, I've been training for, since about 2010 uh, in the area of telemental health counseling. And one thing I try to pride myself in as in is I've always told myself I can pretty much train anyone. And I can remember one day I have someone who was, gave me a phone call and one of the first thing they said to me is, hey, I want to sign up for your, your technology training. How do I go about doing that? So I told them the website, told them how to sign up and, go, and, and they could get started. So they went ahead, they, they got to the, the website and then within five minutes of that, I get a phone call from them. And they're like, hey, got another question for you. Uh, this thing is saying something about a username and password. What does that mean? And I'm just like, I'm not, I was, thought they were joking. I was like, well, I want you to put in the name you want to use on the website. And after that, you need to create a password. And they're like, okay, fine, that's great. And they said, so it can be any username or password I want? I was like, yeah, it can be anything you want it to be. So just choose what's going to work for you. And so they that so about five minutes passes. And they call back and they say, hey, I've got into the class. I've got my username and password, but I'm having a problem. I'm like, well, tell me what your problem is. They said, well, the computer, uh, it, it says in order for me to be able to use your website, I have to enable cookies. I said, okay. I said, what's the problem? They like, I don't have any cookies in my house. And I was, I thought they were, first I thought they were joking. I thought they were trying to be funny, but that, this person was as serious as they could be. And so uh, I said, no, it's not asking for a physical cookie. It's saying, a basic explanation what a cookie was. A cookie is just basically how your computer knows. Uh, it's like a bookmark basically for your computer to go back to the same website over and over again. So you have to be able to enable, you have to enable your browsers, the cookies on your browser. And so they said, I said, so how do you, I said, what, what website are you using? What browser are you using for your computer? They said, I don't know. I said, well, I said, well how do you get on your computer? They said, well, there's this button in the back of it, and I pressed it to turn it on. I said, no, that's, that's not what I'm asking you. I said, how do you get on your computer? And they were like, well, I'm not really sure about this. My, my spouse ends up doing it for me. And so I did my best, and I talked to that person again, and we tried to work that out. Let's just say that after about 15 phone calls and 20 emails, I gave up and I gave that person a refund for their course because I was kind of like, you know what, this is obviously not a strength area of yours. And so they did not have competency when it came to technology. They didn't even know how to get their computer to, to be able to take a class in technology. And so for me, on my end, I didn't see, uh, it didn't seem wise for them to get trained in, in, in doing technology counseling with others as well. So it's important for you to make sure that you have the ability to learn about technology. And the same thing for your clients is that they aren't really familiar uh, with using computers and things of that nature, that this may not be the best way to do it. Another thing to consider is how will crisis be handled when it comes to uh, telemental health counseling? Uh, one of the uh, important things that I do, especially with, like, I, like I live in Arkansas, I've lived in Arkansas for 12 years now. And so the entire time I've been here in Arkansas, uh, I've got a very good resource list of all the counselors uh, in, this, in the state for the most part. I know the, the crisis hotlines for my state, uh, for the different areas of the state as well. And so if I, if I work with clients throughout the state, I know exactly where my clients, I know exactly how to get help to my clients anytime they find themselves in a crisis. Now, I, it took a lot of work for me to do that just for the state I, that I'm in. Now imagine being licensed in multiple states and trying to keep up with that information for all the states you're licensed for. 
that makes it pretty hard. And so I'm not saying that it's impossible to be able to handle a crisis online. I'm just saying it's more difficult. And so you just have to make sure be sure that you're prepared to know the like the local hotline numbers, the phone numbers for the local hospitals, uh, for the local police department, things of that nature, uh, the community mental health centers. These are all places that you want to make sure you have the information for, and that way you can handle a crisis in the right way. And so the best part of it is being prepared beforehand, and uh, that, that can be difficult at times, but don't, once again, it's not impossible to do crisis online. It just makes it a lot more difficult when you're doing it in multiple places. And so this is why for me personally, I only practice in one state, even though I'm licensed in multiple states. And, and, and that's just, a, for, for me, I just think it's a, it's a smarter way for me to go about doing it because handling crisis becomes difficult when you go across state lines. Another thing that we look at is that we want to look at different informed consent. So I have one informed consent for my clients who are my uh, in count, in set, or my clients I see inside of my office. And for those people who I see on video, I use a different informed consent. And so we talk about things like if, if we get disconnected during a counseling session, who's going to call who? Uh, you know, being able to verify who my client is, you know, so uh, create a password, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Do certain things like that. And all this in my informed consent so that they can understand uh, what to expect out of me. Uh, we even go through uh, the process for me of telling them where I was trained, uh, the training I have, different things of that nature. Also, the fact that I'm licensed as well. And so those are a lot, just a few things you want to make sure that goes into your informed consent. And I use a different informed consent for my clients who I see online versus my clients who I see in a face-to-face, uh, -face, like in a, in a traditional counseling setting. Also, we want to think, once again, go back to that professional liability insurance. Is once again, does my liability insurance cover me for using telemental health counseling? So we have to be in, make sure that it does. And so we want to check with them prior to us beginning our counseling sessions to make sure we're covered. Now, the, the reality of it is most uh, liability insurance companies are, are, are up to speed when it comes to telemental health counseling. But, but the majority of them, and I, was, not, I wouldn't say majority, I would say all they want to do is will say that they will cover you once again as long as you are trained in telemental health counseling. So it's important for you to make sure that you do have training before you get, to, before you start practicing in this manner. And so just making sure you have the professional liability insurance, that have, make sure you have it, but also that it will cover you as well. And also making sure it is appropriate for the client. Uh, one of the big things we see with the Code of Ethics is that with regards to what modality of services we're offering to our clients, we can't force our clients into using a certain services. So if they're not comfortable using telemental health, we can't force them to do that. And for some clients, it just may not be appropriate. Maybe it may be an age thing where they're too young and they're not able to uh, to connect with you in that way, or it's hard for you to build rapport with them uh, in that matter. Or maybe they have some type of uh, personality disorder that, that that really doesn't mesh well with doing counseling in an online environment. And so it's important for you to make sure you check the appropriateness of your client. Maybe it's a client who's had multiple suicide attempts recently uh, or homicide attempts recently, and because of that, it, it, it may be a lot better for them to come in to see me in my counseling office versus uh, doing it in the online environment. And obviously, I realize being, with, with being in the midst of, of COVID-19, we see that, that that can be a big issue for a lot of people, but we still have to make sure that we don't force people into doing it that way, that once again, this has to be something they, they feel comfortable with, and we also need to make sure that it's actually something appropriate for uh, the client. So a few different things when we, when we think about telemental health, we've talked a little bit some, about some of the background of it so far and what that looks like. Now we just want to talk a little bit about the marketing aspect of it. Then when it comes to marketing uh, yourself as a practitioner, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing that. Uh, you know, Facebook uh, now owns Instagram, and so they're, they're basically the, uh, the same company. But those are really good places to be able to uh, market your counseling services, where you're able to uh, put uh, do commercials and, uh, and things of that nature, or uh, advertise for your practice. And you can do that, and, and you would do that through a business Facebook page. And so you can do a business Facebook page, uh, talk about the services that you offer, or you can do the same thing uh, through Instagram, where you're able to do some uh, advertisement and things of that nature. But it, once again, it depends on the audience that you are looking for. Uh, for Facebook, I would say, uh, is for individuals who are 
definitely for people for those individual age 30 and over and the under 30 crowd is probably going to be which where you're, you're going to find those uh, people on Instagram that's what that what that kind of uh, that's the audience you find there and so once again knowing your audience and what you're marketing for is going to be super important but the, using uh, just using social media in general can be a good thing for you also, it can be a blog or podcast. Those things are important. People are, even in 2020, are still are interested in blogs and podcasts and listening to experts on different topics. So maybe these are, that may be one way for you to be able to grab the attention of some clients is through blogs and through, po- through podcasts. And they can help you uh, quite a bit in being able to do that as well. Another one way of doing the, the marketing is, is offering phone consultations or other electronic communication as a bonus to your clients. So let's just say that you already have uh, a video, you're already doing on-ground client therapy with a client already. What you can do in this scenario is since you already have on-ground clients, you may start using uh, telemental health as a way to bridge the gap and add extra services on for your clients. So maybe they can't make it to a traditional counseling session. What you can do is offer them a bonus session through the use of video or text or whatever the case may be, and so it may it may help you to be able to package a, a bigger deal thing, a bigger deal for them, so they can have more than one way to be in contact with you. And this this may be a way for the, for them to transition over from just being in the office to seeing you online as well. But just phone consultations could be a good way for that to happen. Another thing we think about marketing is just thinking about our websites. And so the question to ask here, like, would you uh, go see a counselor who did not have a website? And um, one thing I would definitely like for you to do uh, as a part of this video, and you, and, and you can, uh, uh, after I tell you to do this, you can pause real quick and, and do this. But I would like you to go and check out about three to four different websites uh, for counselors. So basically, uh, go to Google, look at and, and Google your the uh, uh, your, the city that you're in and just put counselors in and then put your city in there. And it's going to bring up several different uh, websites for counselors in your area. And I want you to start looking at and look at least three or four different websites of counselors and to see how different counselors talk about themselves or talk about their practice because you're going to see the differences of uh, what people are seeing. And the reason why I want you to, to do this exercise because it's important for you to realize that clients, do, that's how they find you. They find you through your website and they do evaluate you based on your website. So if your spelling is incorrect or if, the, if you don't talk too much about what type of therapy you do or if your website is hard to navigate, all these things in general are ways for um, individuals to be able to, uh, to evaluate their counselor's website. So like I said, at, uh, so once we get the, done with the slide here, just take, I want you to pause the video, the video and take about oh, maybe 10 minutes or so and go and look at three, I will, we'll say yeah, three websites of counselors. And as you go through there, do some navigating, see which, which ones are easy to work with, see which ones are harder to deal, deal with. And that will give you a, a better picture of that in general. Another thing is, as you do that, start evaluating and think about how would you evaluate the counselor based on the website. Is the website warm? When you look at the colors, do the pictures seem to match well with them? Does the one as a as you as you hear the message they're trying to portray through their website, does it make you feel more close to this person, or is it something that kind of repulses you? What does how what do, how are you feeling as you look at these counseling websites? So, uh, like I said, this would be a good place for you to pause. Take about, I'll say three, uh, take about, about take about 10 minutes and look at three different council websites and go and see wh- what these sites, how these sites are different from each other. That way it can give you an idea of how their marketing may be taking place on a website or how their marketing is not taking place on a website at all. But I think it's important for us to see how people are putting themselves out there uh, when it comes to the world of counseling or if there's a specific type of counseling that you're looking for, maybe it's marital counseling or whatever the case may be, Use that in your Google search as well. But I, I just would take about 10 minutes. I want you to look at three websites uh, and be thinking about how do you go about evaluating your website and what would your website look like once you do it and what and how do these different websites speak to you. So take about 10 minutes to do that now. All right, so we've we've done the uh, well, the looking at websites and we've taken a few minutes to kind of evaluate uh, where uh, where these clients' webs uh, these different therapists' websites are, and hopefully those those different websites spoke to you as well. 
Uh, now we want to talk a little bit about client communication and how do we go about communicating with our clients in an online environment. One thing we want to talk about is texting. Should we text our clients? Now, one thing I do realize is that many of you who are watching this video probably are working in some type of community mental health setting. And so the reason why I want to bring this up is that the, the problem with texting and clients is a lot of times is that people's bosses are wanting them to, to use their own personal cell phone in order to be able to connect with their clients. The problem with this is, is that you end up having to give out your own personal number to clients, but you don't want to do that. And so I would say that when we, especially when we look at, at the ethics of this, you would definitely want to get a separate phone line to be able to you, uh, use if you're going to text your clients. And even if I were to text my clients, it would be about their appointment times only, unless you're actually doing counseling through text. So for example, I use an electronic health system where it will send out an automatic text message to remind people of their counseling session and if they need to to, uh, to cancel, they can uh, all reply back and that does all that automatically for me. So I don't have to really have to worry about that because of the system I use. But not everyone has a system like that. But the reality of it is you don't want to be sending out text messages to your clients about the things that you're doing. Or I mean, just, you, don't, you don't want to send out a text message to your clients about anything that's not uh, appointment related. So if you're telling them appointment time has changed or something like that, that's fine. But outside of that, you don't want to get into anything deeper in that unless you're once again trained in doing telemental health counseling through the use of text. So be very careful as you're going about and doing that. Another thing is emailing clients. Uh, just once again, so like for the, the system I use, it's, it sends them out an email to get their intake paperwork uh, taken care of. So they, they go to a link, they can fill out uh, from that link, they are able to go into my electronic health record, and they're able to uh, fill out the information about what their, their their intake paperwork, which helps out significantly during that first session. But once again, maybe I'm not texting client. Maybe I'm just sending them a uh, message about email. So the important reason why why I bring this up is that it, when we think about this emailing the client on, on, on from this perspective, it's okay for me to be go ahead and send them this message, uh, maybe just for the purpose of looking at um, uh, what, their, what their appointment time is. But outside of that, once again, I'm going to stay away from it. Now, let's, let's go back to texting. There's something I just, I just thought about that I think would be very helpful for you to, to think about. Now, there are several different businesses out there where their business model is where they do texting with their client. Now, I'm going to tell you about an experience I had with this a few years ago, which uh, that got me away from getting working with companies like that, where they do uh, what they do to all their, their business, basically through texting. So for this, this at least for this group, it, I won't use the name of the group or anything, uh, but what they basically, the way they advertise it is, you'll see their messages on Facebook or their advertising on Facebook, and they're basically saying, if you don't feel well, you can always send it, uh, you can contact with us, and you can connect with the therapist, and for like, for $19.95 a week, you can, you can, uh, do, you can work with the therapist. Now, that sounds great, you know, on the pricing-wise of it, but the way those things work is not ethical when it comes to the client. So this is a situation that I was in. So let's just say it was on, a, this was like a Sunday night, uh, and um, let's say that the, the client's name is Amy. So Amy is not feeling well. Amy is needing some counseling. So she sees this advertisement on Facebook, and she goes on to the website, and she signs up, and this is what her message reads. Hey, I'm not really feeling really well. I think I want to harm myself. Uh, I've got a gun right beside me, and I really want to hurt myself. Will someone please contact me back as soon as possible? And she sends the message out. Now, once again, this is a true story. Change the name of the client. So that, so that ends up, so that, that goes out, that, that message goes out, and the way the system works for this uh, particular company uh, it, whoever is in their company is uh, the clinicians who see the most clients are the first ones who get those messages. So this message goes out on a Sunday night, and so it goes to the first therapist. The first therapist looks at it. They begin to read the email, and it says, "Oh, this woman's talking about suicide. I don't really feel like dealing with suicide, so I'm not going to mess with her." And so they hit a button that says, "They hit decline." And so what happens is, is that message now goes to a new therapist. 
So now it's, it's Sunday. It's going to the new therapist. And new therapists, they don't check their messages every single day. And so finally, maybe on Monday evening, another therapist sees that this person has emailed them about, the, about therapy services. They begin reading. They realize this person is suicidal. So now they're thinking, I don't want to deal with this person at all. So then what do they do? You guessed it. They hit the button refer, and they send, which sends them to another therapist. Well, this goes on for six days. And the reason I know this is because it, 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 it marks on there when the first message was sent out. And so the first message was sent out like on Sunday night at 8 p.m. I get the message on Saturday around noon. Now, I don't know. So by this time, this person has gone through at least 10 to 15 different therapists, all who have pushed forward this person's information because they don't want to work with them. And now I'm getting their message on Saturday, even though it was sent out on Sunday. And this message is saying, hey, I have a gun beside me from this past Sunday night and I want to harm myself. I need somebody to contact me as soon as possible. So I reach out to this person. And like I said, we'll make this person named Amy or whatever. And Amy's not answering the phone. Also, on this, this website that, that offers a service like this, they don't require you to, the client to give their real name. They don't, uh, now, uh, they don't require the client to, uh, to tell the state and city they live in. And so here I am with information about a person who I'm don't, not sure if Amy is even her real name. I don't know if, where Amy lives. All I know is that Amy is su- was suicidal on Sunday with a gun beside her, and now I'm calling her or, or responding back to her message, and I never hear back from her. Now I'm in an ethical situation because now the question now becomes, who's responsible if Amy ends up taking her life? Is it the first therapist who hit, uh, who didn't want to see her, didn't want to talk to her? Was it the second therapist? Was it the eight or nine other therapists who didn't do it? Or was it me who actually reached out to her? So this becomes very dangerous. So even regardless of a website says, do not, do not use our service if you are feeling suicidal, the reality of it is this can still happen. So I'm, I'm very leery of websites who only do use telemental health through texting purposes only. And so I, I, so I told you that story to say, you know, I, after that experience, when I couldn't get back in touch with her, the company basically says, hey, we're not responsible because we just connect therapists and clients. We're not, we don't, we're the middleman. We don't, we're not really responsible. And so all that responsibility ends up falling on clients, I'm on, on the therapist. And so I just, I tell you that to say that once you, once you graduate and you do get out there and start doing uh, telemental health counseling and you see these, all these companies are offering great money to work with people just doing text only, be careful about doing that because you, you can be putting your, these clients in, in, a, in a really bad situation, especially if they're not able to get in contact with you. And even if though the site may say, don't contact us if you're in crisis, people can still be in crisis mode and that can happen to them as well. Another thing we want to think about is just using your own cell phone number. Is that a good idea? Uh, I, I'm an Apple person, and so on my phone, I actually have three different phone lines. I have one phone line, which is my, my regular phone line that my family and my friends can get in contact with me on. Then I have a second phone line, which is actually a Google Voice line, and I use that for my students. And so anytime my students call, they can call me on that line, and it's a separate line from my personal line. And it's a different phone number as well. And then I have a third app that is for my clients, and I use that as well. And one thing I'd make sure that I do is that I never save the phone numbers for my clients if a, if a client calls me. Because one thing that's interesting that happens is, is whenever you start saving phone numbers in your phone from clients or from anyone, you'll notice on social media, they'll start suggesting friends to you. And the reason why I suggest these friends to you is because it found that information on your phone. And so I would definitely tell, to you, tell you, do not add uh, phone numbers or client names in your cell phone, or even if you're using a separate app. Because when you do that, it does open you up to uh, a connection with them on social media. Also, with client communication, 
when the question then becomes when do you be are you able to turn it off some people when they see the term online therapy that means they feel like you are available 24 hours a day and seven days a week and so the reality of it is you're not available then and so you need to be able to have boundaries on when you're able you're going to contact people back so maybe it's going to be within 24 hours through email or 24 hours through a text or 24 hours through a phone call whatever the case may be but you need to make sure you have some way of turning it off and having some boundaries set up that way as well and also the code of ethics talks about friending clients that you're not supposed to be connected with anybody on social media uh, as a friend now I even take it a step further that I don't even uh, friend their family members as well uh, and the reason why is because I want to make sure that, that we have a total separate we have a total professional relationship and there's never a question about me as a, as a, cl a clinician and so it's important to make sure that you, once again when you get on social media that you do not uh, friend your clients you don't want to have them on your friends list in any type of social media especially if it's on your personal account so when you think about um, personal use of social media and technology, just a couple of things here uh, right towards the end, is what can clients access without you knowing? Uh, so one thing I uh, uh, tell people to always do is to make sure that when you own social media that you have two different accounts. Have a professional Facebook page where you are, you're, uh, for me, so I have a, a Facebook page for my counseling practice and I only talk about counseling related things on there. And also, I have a Facebook page, just my personal one, where I share the pictures of my family and things like that. And once again, I have those two separate things. Now, I don't have a problem with my client connecting to my professional Facebook page because a lot of different people connect to that page. It doesn't mean someone's necessarily a client just because they connect with it because, you know, I, I post like inspirational thoughts and different things like that. So there's no issue with that. But on my personal page, I don't have any connection with my clients. And so I keep my page as private as possible. Now, I do have a few, uh, especially Facebook, I do have some social, some stuff that is public information. But usually when it's something public, it's probably something funny or whatever the case may be. But it's never anything personal about myself. And so I try to make, uh, make sure that I keep those two lives separate, that I have a personal life and I have a professional life on social media. Also, you just need to be aware of your school and employer policies when it comes to your social media accounts. I've known of students uh, before and also people who work as counselors who've lost their jobs or been removed from school because of their social media, because of things they are posting. Now, you may be thinking, well, for my social media, um, what, what difference does that make? What I, what I think? Well, the, the fact is that as a student and also as a employee, you are representing that company. And so if, if for them, it's easier for them to get rid of you for that than to face, face a lawsuit. And so my thing is make sure you be careful about what you put on social media. And if, if you do have personal opinions about certain things, that's fine. Just make sure you have it set to a, 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 to a privacy level where only your, your friends are able to see it. But the reality of it is that people can take screenshots these days. They have been for a long time. And so just be careful about what you put on social media. Also, potential employers will check your social media. And sometimes they will have people to do it for them. So if they know they're not a friend with you, they may get someone else to check. And once again, this is their way of being able to say, is this person the right person to work with us? And so uh, as you look for jobs, be, once again, be mindful of what, what it says about your social media. And also, when it comes to your, your social media, when it comes to potential clients, the Code of Ethics says we can't look up our clients or potential clients on social media. And this is a really important thing for us to think about. Now, you might be thinking, why, why can't I do that? You know, well, I just, I'm, I'm curious. Well, your curiosity does not, does, is not a, a good reason for you to break the Code of Ethics. And so if you do have potential clients who are on, so, so say for instance, uh, I'm making up, this is a name I'm making up. You, so you have Abby Johnson, who is going to be a new intake of yours, and you just want to do some research, you know, to find out who this person is, and you go on their, on their Facebook page or, or, what, or their social media page to find out more about them, the Code of Ethics says you are breaking the code by doing that. So we stay off of our social media when it belongs to our clients. Even after they're our clients, not our clients anymore, we still stay away from their social media. And so I can remember doing a training one time at a, a, a at a residential facility where uh, a, a one of the clients there had stolen a cell phone from their um, 
from one of the, the, fa- the staff there. And so at, uh, during the nighttime, the, 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 this client would uh, take the cell phone and go on Facebook Live and, do, and, and, and have a good old time on Facebook Live. And so the staff and faculty there were trying to catch this person by going on their social media so they could find out who stole the phone. And so after I talked to them, I said, hey, you can't do that. They said, well, no, they're, they're breaking the law. I said, I understand that. But you're also breaking the ethical code by looking at their social media because they are your client. So be careful when it comes to that. Don't go on your client's social media. Uh, make sure your social media is locked down so that, you, that they're not able to see yours either. And that just ends up being best practice for you in general. And so as we conclude uh, this presentation, I, I want to say I hope that this has helped you just get a better picture about telemental health counseling, some of the do's and don'ts, and, and, and this, this is some different ways of maneuvering uh, telemental health counseling. Uh, on Facebook, there's a group called a Telemental Health Counselor Connection. Uh, there's about 5,000 different individuals on there who practice online therapy. Uh, this is a good free resource for you that you can use to find out more about how to practice online. So I would definitely encourage you uh, to join this group. That will give you some better information, not I should say better information, but more information about how to do telemental health counseling. Because this video basically kind of give you the basics of it, but in this group you'll be able to be, to be connected with professionals from all, from all over the United States who've been practicing for a long time, and you, you're able to ask questions on there, and it's also a free resource for you. So I hope this video has been helpful to you, and uh, if you do have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to me. Hope you have a great day.